we're back again to answer some of your coronavirus questions and to try and address some of the concerns that the EQ community has. I'm virologist Dr Kirsty Short and I'm here with immunologist Professor Ian Fraser and we're just going to go through the top 10 questions people have been asking this week about coronavirus. So Ian, I'm just going to launch right into it. We're hearing lots about testing. Why is it important to keep testing now that the virus has been spreading in the community? Kirsty, thanks for that question. It's quite an important one. We need to understand the rate at which the epidemic is spreading, and particularly we need to identify people who are infectious but not sick, so that we can isolate them for safety. But we don't want universal testing. First of all, we don't have enough kits to do that, and we really need to keep the kits for those people who are in need of testing. And secondly, the test itself does not absolutely give you security. You know, it doesn't tell you whether you are, haven't been infected yet or whether you might have been infected in the past but are now well. It only tells you whether the virus can be found right now in you. Mm. And I think it's really this point of testing is really one of the lessons that we've learned from other countries. We see in South Korea that part of their effective response was very high levels of testing and actually Australia is doing really, really well with testing. All right, so talking about testing, what exactly is, does the test involve? Look, the test involves basically collecting a sample either from the back of your throat uh, by sticking a small wire with a bit of cotton wool on it down the back of your throat or down your nose or if you are coughing, then collecting sputum, spit, because that, that's where we find the virus. What we actually do with that is to look for the genetic information of the virus. It's, a, it's called the PCR test, and it's a very sensitive and specific test for the virus. And one thing I would add to that is if you do have to have the uh, nasal test, it does hurt a little bit, so just heads up. Okay, so this is uh, something that we hear a lot, um, people comparing this virus to flu. So from what we're seeing now, does COVID-19 seem to be more severe than flu? It's, the virus is certainly causing more of an impact in the community than flu does during a normal epidemic of flu. Obviously, there are a lot of people who are infectious and there are a significant number of people who have been in contact with people who are infectious. How bad it's going to be in Australia in comparison to flu is something we're going to find out. Uh, the worst flu epidemics are certainly as bad as the, some of the statistics we have at the moment for coronavirus but we really don't know how it's going to impact in Australia yet. My guess is it will turn out to be worse than the, even the worst flus. Yeah, and I think really the point to remember here is that we're exposed to flu very regularly. And even though we have new flu strains coming up, we still have some level of pre-existing immunity. And the problem that we have here is this is a completely new virus in the human population. So that's partly why it's causing such a severe impact. Yeah, we lack a vaccine at the moment and we have a vaccine for flu and the vaccine mm. is for flu is not perfect but it reduces the impact of flu in the community. You get it less severely and less likely to spread it. So that's why coronavirus and COVID-19 is such a problem at the moment is because it is spreading fast in the community. Exactly. So I think this is a question that's on a lot of people's minds. Should I be catching public transport to work? Well, the government advice at the moment is don't go to work if you can work from home. And for many of us, including myself, I can do most of my work from home. That saves the problem of having to use public mm -hmm. transport. If you do have to use public transport, then adopt all of the precautions that we expect you to adopt. Keep your distance from people, 1.5 metre separation, try not to touch them. Practice hand hygiene, don't touch things you don't need to touch because they might have been touched by someone else. And if the public transport happens to be overcrowded and you can't get the space, maybe walk, maybe find some other time that you can go to work. Because clearly we want to avoid close personal contact for 15 minutes or more. And one place where that could happen is an overcrowded public transport vehicle. That's exactly right. So where possible, work from home. If not, take the necessary precautions. All right, this has been something that a lot of families have been concerned about and it still remains a little bit controversial. Should I be worried about sending my child to school? Yes, look, the, the statistics at the moment show that children that get the virus, by and large, have not been getting sick. And that's a good thing. Uh, now, unfortunately, of course, the child may be infectious for other people. Education is such an important part of bringing up the next generation that it really would be difficult to imagine 
that we could manage without educating our children for the period of time that the epidemic is likely to be about. If there were alternate methods of doing it, then they will probably come into effect. But re in, in reality, the challenge is not the children going to school, it's the problem for the parents if the children stay at home. Mm -hmm. There are so many people who are essentially pro providing essential services in the community that if they were withdrawn would really create a problem. And if you have two parents working and the children are not able to be looked after at school, then they're going to be looked after by someone. And the alternate in Italy was the grandparents. And the net result of that were a lot of grandparents got infected. Yeah, and I think this is something we're particularly passionate about because this is something that our group has actually been researching. And thus far, we haven't really found any good evidence that kids are driving the transmission of this virus within the home. They can get infected, but it's really not necessarily the kids who are bringing it into the home. So from that perspective, and when you consider exactly what you say, that a lot of healthcare workers are dependent on childcare in order to do their job, it's really important not just to consider a blanket response of shut all schools immediately, because that has these knock-on consequences for the healthcare workers and the rest of the community. All right, this is another one that relates to family. Should I be looking after my elderly parents if I'm still going to work? Ideally, no. Mm. The reality is that you are more likely to give them the virus if you've been going to work. You may, you may be a carrier, you may not know that yet. Uh, and the elderly are definitely vulnerable to this virus. The older you are, the more likely you are, if you get the infection, to die as a consequence of it. But there are some practical realities in life. You may be the only carers for your elderly parents, and then, of course, that clearly re is, requires you to think carefully about how you can manage looking after them without putting them at risk. Again, distance separation is important, hand hygiene is important, and thinking about alternate ways of doing things is equally important. But it, it may just be that you need to deliver food to them, but if you actually have to physically get involved in their care, then you should be using gloves if you're concerned about spreading the infection or give it, giving the infection from one to the other. It's going to be a case of individual solutions for individual situations, but ideally the answer is no. And I think this is really hard for a lot of people because it is really hard being in a situation where you can't hug your parents. I, I personally have a 90-year-old father and it's really tough not being able to see him. But we do have to make these small adjustments and consider the health of not just ourselves but also others during these sorts of times. So this year UQ's brought forward its flu vaccination program. Can you just tell us a little bit uh, about why now more than ever it's so important to get vaccinated against flu? Kirsty, the main reason is because we don't want to see people getting both the coronavirus and flu. But the flu vaccine is a sensible thing to get anyway, particularly if you're in a higher risk group for flu. The elderly, anybody over the age of 60 and children under the age of five are particularly vulnerable to flu each year. We don't know how flu will work with COVID-19, but I can predict that it will not be a good thing to have both of them. So you should get the flu vaccine. And I think the other thing to mention there as well is that actually we want to be trying to do everything we can to reduce the burden of the health on the healthcare system at the moment. So if you can reduce the number of people who are hospitalised for flu, you could potentially free up beds for people who have a severe COVID-19 infection. So it's also about just trying to do your bit to reduce that healthcare burden. All right, so um, this is an interesting one. This question asks, how could a covered COVID-19 patient be useful in research efforts to develop the vaccine or treatments? Well, obviously, one of the things we need to learn is how our body's own defences cope with COVID-19. And we're not really clear about that yet. So people who have had the virus and recovered from it are actually very informative because we know that the sort of immune response they've generated will have cleared the virus infection away. We can also find out then how long protection might be likely to last after you've had the infection because that will become clear if we find a blood test that's indicative of how they've actually cleared the virus. And of course, finally, it may help us with the development of a vaccine because the sort of immune response that cleared the virus infection may give some guidance as to how a vaccine might work. So that all, all these things mean it's really useful to have people who have had the, had the virus infection and have recovered from it available for research. And 
particularly of interest is we really need a marker of who has been infected in the community. The people who have been infected, if they turn out to then be well, well protected against future infection, will be very useful in the later stages of the epidemic. They'll be the people who can go and work relatively confident that they're not going to get reinfected, and therefore they will be able to work in situations which otherwise would be regarded as high risk. And I think the other thing that's really important to know there is how long this immunity will last in people with those underlying medical conditions. So that's something that we're also looking into. So there's lots and lots of research information that we can glean from patients who've recovered from the virus. So this also relates a little bit to research. How do researchers choose human candidates to test their vaccines? Well, funnily enough, we ask for volunteers. Uh, nobody, is, nobody is required to take part in research. But we may have a particular group of people that we're interested in, such as people who have recovered from COVID-19 or people of a particular age group. And then we will advertise one way or another. There, there, there are organisations that help with finding people to take part in clinical trials. But uh, usually we have a fairly clear target group in mind and we just approach them directly and ask them if they're interested in volunteering. All right, and just on to our final question. This is, this is a big picture one. How long will we know, how long will it be until we know the potential long-term effects of COVID-19? This is a very important question. COVID-19 does seem to produce lung damage which lasts longer than just the acute illness. And we don't know how quickly that will clear up and we don't know who's, who's vulnerable to it. So that's one of the reasons why we will certainly be following up patients that have had COVID-19 infection and recovered from it, at have various degrees of severity of infection, just to understand better whether this is going to produce long-term lung, lung damage or not. And perhaps also at the same time to think then about whether we need to do earlier interventions when interventions become available. Yeah, and I think the message is really there that we still do have a lot to learn. And as a scientific community, we're working really, really hard to do that. But in the interim, what we need people to do is to follow these guidelines and to keep themselves safe and also to keep the broader community safe. Yeah, we, ca we can't stress strongly enough mm -hmm. that we have some very good rules put in place to try and minimise people's risk of getting this infection. And if we follow those rules as best we can, then we will certainly slow the epidemic down. And as an individual, you may be able to protect yourself against infection altogether. So that's basically it from us today. We hope that this has been informative for everyone and also reassuring that yes, we are going to get through this, but in the interim, we just have to make these adjustments to our lifestyle that will ultimately keep everybody in the community safe. And in the background, the research is going on that will answer the questions that you're raising and hopefully come up with some practical solutions to prevent people getting this virus in the future and stop them getting sick if they do.